Welcome everyone. My name is Hilary Rantisi and I'm a senior fellow at Religion and Public Life at Harvard Divinity School and also Associate Director of Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative. It is my pleasure today to introduce our guests. But before that, I want to recognize our co-sponsors of this event, the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Belfer Center at Harvard Kennedy School and the Program on Law and Society in the Muslim World at Harvard Law School. Today is also a special day for us at Harvard Divinity School as we launch the Religion and Public Life program under which the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative will be housed. We will be sending out information about this, but please feel free to reach out to connect with us. Now, finally, I have the distinct honor to introduce Professor Rashid Khalidi and Professor Rosie Bashir. Professor Rashid Khalidi was my professor and advisor at the University of Chicago. He endured me as a student, and it's always a pleasure to host him here at Harvard. He's currently the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies in the Department of History at Columbia University, and is co-editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies. He was president of the Middle East Studies Association and an advisor to the Palestinian delegation to the Madrid and Washington Arab-Israeli peace negotiations from October 1991 until June 1993, which uh, if you read his book, you will read about in, in much more detail. Uh, he received his bachelor's from Yale University and a doctorate of philosophy from Oxford University. He taught at the Lebanese University, the American University of Beirut, Georgetown University and the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Khalidi is the author of, of numerous award-winning books, which have been translated into several languages and over 110 scholarly articles. Among his books are The Iron Cage, The Story of the Palestinian Struggle for Statehood, Palestinian Identity, Resurrecting Empire, Western Footprints, and America's Perilous Path in the Middle East, Sewing Crisis, the Cold War, and American Hegemony in the Middle East. His most recent book is uh, The Hundred Years War on Palestine, a history of settler colonialism and resistance, 1917 to 2017, and it's the focus of our event today. It's also shortlisted for the Kundal Prize in Historical Literature. Professor, and now I'll move on to introducing Professor Rosie Bashir who is a historian of the modern Middle East and assistant professor of history at Harvard. She's also an affiliate at the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative. Her teaching and research interests center on Arab and social movements, petrocapitalism and state formation and the production of historical knowledge and commemorative spaces. She received her PhD in history from Columbia University and comes to Harvard University from Yale, where she was assistant professor of history. She's a recipient of several awards, the Purvu Family Award for Disciplinary Teaching at Yale, and Yale's College Sarai Rubikov Award for the Encouragement of Teaching. Professor Bashir just published her first book, Archive Wars, The Politics of History in Saudi Arabia, and a book launch will be taking place next week at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies uh, on um, the 20th. So I encourage you all to attend. Um, and before we start, I just want to give some um, notes, uh, points about the flow of the event today and some housekeeping notes. So um, Professor uh, Rashid Khalidi will first give a brief overview of his book and, uh, and possibly a reading, uh, followed by um, a discussion with um, uh, Professor Bashir, where they'll engage in conversation about the book, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience. Welcome, everyone. We welcome all those who are joining us for this webinar, and a special welcome to our guests, uh, Professor Khalidi and Professor Bashir. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll leave the floor to you. So shall I start by talking a little bit about the book? Um, this is not the first book that I've written on Palestine, but I was um, 
I was driven to write it by a different set of circumstances than have impelled me in anything else I've ever done, uh, insofar as articles, scholarly articles and books uh, are concerned. Uh, my son, uh, Smail, uh, came to me and, and said very insistently, and he can be very insistent, uh, Pa, you really have to write a book uh, which is accessible to an ordinary audience, to people who are not experts, to uh, people who are not academics. Uh, and he was very persuasive. Uh, other members of the family were urging me in the same direction, one of my cousins in particular. Um, they said, you know, enough already with the scholarly monographs. And, you know, I, I've written other kinds of things as op-eds and so forth, but all of my, all of my books and m m all of the articles that Hillary mentioned uh, were essentially directed at other historians and other specialists on the Middle East. So I tried to write a different kind of book. And I tried to do it in a way that brought in experiences of other people who I knew, many of them, most of them actually members of my family, but also other people uh, to whose memoirs or to whose memories I had access. Uh, and I did something that I had never done in any of my other writing, which was to talk about things in the first person. Um, we are trained rigorously. I was trained at Oxford and before that as an undergraduate uh, to take, you know, the historian takes herself or himself out of the writing. Um, there's an attempt to, to write in the third person, to write in a manner that's supposed to be objective and so forth. Uh, I threw all that out the window with this book. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in this book, uh, as are other people who I knew or who I was told stories by or whose memoirs or whose writings I used in a way that I hope capitalizes on uh, things that make the book easy to read and, and approachable for people. So that's the first thing I want to say about the book. The second thing I want to say about the book is it's an attempt to turn on its head what I think is an essentially false way of understanding what's happening and, and what has happened in Palestine and between Palestinians and Israelis. Um, the way in which this is usually understood uh, in, in the best of times uh, would argue that this is a struggle over the same land between two peoples who have equal rights and are on more or less a basis of equality. I argue that that is largely a false way of understanding it. I argue that this is a struggle between a people that lived in a country uh, to which another group came, uh, operated in terms of settler colonialism, and only were able to do so with the assistance of enormously powerful forces, the British Empire in the first instance, and later other powers, most notably the United States up to the present. And this has to be understood not as a struggle just between Palestinians and Israelis or between the Zionist movement and the Palestinian national movement. It was those things, but also as a settler colonial war on the Palestinians to establish a new people that was intended to supplant them. I'm not arguing that that struggle didn't create an Israeli people or that that Israeli people didn't have connections to the land. I'm arguing that this has to be understood as early Zionists understood it as a settler colonial process, even as they saw themselves as recreating ancient Israel. And I'm arguing that this is how it has to be understood in comparative perspective. Um, there are important differences uh, between what happens in Palestine, between the creation of the, the establishment of the Zionist movement and the present, and what happened, say, in Ireland, or what happened, say, in Algeria, or what happened in, say, South Africa or Kenya. But those processes share a, a number of, of features that I try and emphasize in the book that are characteristic of all settler colonial wars uh, and that are characteristic in particular of the enormously important role of an external backer, a metropole for this for the colonial settler project. So that's the, the if you want, theoretical frame of the book. And it takes the, uh, 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 it, it takes the course of looking at various episodes in the history that I describe as uh, phases of the war on Palestine. Uh, I describe uh, each of these phases as beginning with the declaration of war, which in most cases is not a declaration of war between the two parties that are actually struggling over the land, the Palestinians and the Israelis. It's usually a declaration of war, which an international instance, the League of Nations or Britain or the United States or the UN Security Council um, has, 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 has proclaimed. Um, and so that's the structure of the book. Uh, that's the way in which I tried to write the book. Um, and Rosie and I are going to talk about the book. Uh, right now. Um, so th I, I think that's enough uh, 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 as far as an exposition of how I, what I was trying to do. Well, um, first of all, hello, everyone. 
Thank you so much for joining us. Let me just quickly, Rashid, thank um, folks at the RCPI at Harvard Divinity School, uh, Hilary, Reem, Navi, and others, um, to the program on law and society in the Muslim world at Harvard Law School. Thank you for bringing us together today to uh, discuss uh, Rashid's book. Of course, special thanks to Professor Rashid Khalidi, my mentor, colleague, and friend. Um, it's a pleasure to be here discussing what might just be your most powerful book yet, Rashid. Uh, those familiar with your work will know what praise this is and just how remarkable I must think the book is. Now, much has changed since I last saw you a lifetime ago on March 4th at Columbia for your book launch. Actually, I saw you uh, two days later at the Palestinian Studies Workshop at Brown University. Right. And I remember many of us had a sense of dread but also appreciation that this might be the last in-person event we hold in a while. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it was. It was, for me too. Yeah, but you know, despite the limitations of this virtual medium, I'm, I'm really excited to be here uh, and discuss in more detail uh, the book with you. But first, I wanna say a few words about the book by way of outlining maybe two broad strokes that I hope will structure our conversation today. Now, for those who have not read the book yet, this is um, a heart-wrenching and, as Rashid has said, personal historical narrative that details the layer upon layer of violence, both symbolic and material, that Palestinians have had to endure, of course, uh, in front of our very own eyes. Now, it's a searing indictment of uh, five actors, if, if you will, Israeli settler colonialism, the British Empire that enabled it, um, the US Empire that sustained it, the Arab regimes that collaborated with it, and the Palestinian leadership, which failed at almost every turn. So we'll hopefully discuss all these actors in more detail, but for now, this will be the first framework. And yet, this is not just a story of defeat. Strikingly, this book is also about hope, about resilience, about Palestinians who have persevered against great odds and who, Rashid tells us, are not going anywhere despite it all. So in many ways, the book is about presence, about the presence of Palestinians despite their exclusion from the geopolitical and legal processes that you detail in the book, the presence of Palestinians despite their ongoing expulsion from their lands, the presence of Palestinians despite their systemic incarceration, oppression, and murder, and the presence of Palestinians despite their elision from the archival record, despite the local, regional, and global efforts to control and um, uh, to, to sanitize the optics while silencing Palestinian voices, despite the ongoing fictions about the origins of the Israeli state. So one of the many things that the book succeeds at, in my opinion, is humanizing Palestinians against a backdrop of ongoing academic and non-academic efforts to strip Palestinians of agency, to deny Palestinians their political identity, and to blame Palestinians in many instances for their own subjugation to the myriad forces that you so well uh, historicize. So the question of whether the Palestinian can speak and to what end is the second framework that I hope will animate our conversation. Now, there is much to unpack in this century long history. So I'm gonna start with two basic questions, basic-ish questions. Uh, first, can you tell us about the choice for, uh, of the cover image for the book, what it is meant to capture? And also, can we talk a bit about the title of the book? So let's not talk about the sub subtitle just yet, just the title, The Hundred Years War on Palestine. Right. Because you organize, as you said, you organize uh, the six chapters of the book around what you conceptualize as declarations of war. That again, you argue, make up a century long war on Palestine and emphasizing on. Can you explain the framing a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I've always felt that the titles of my books were really not very good. Um, and I wanted to have a title that in a certain sense summed up the argument. And I have a feeling that this idea of the hundred years war on Palestine sums up the argument. This is not a tragic struggle between two peoples who are suffering. 
there's a winner and a loser. There's a there's a there's an overwhelmingly powerful party, and there's a much less powerful party. And there is a people that is living peacefully in its land, and upon which war is made waged, repeatedly in different forms by different powers. Sometimes it's the British Empire, sometimes it's the Syrian Army, sometimes it's the Haganah, sometimes it's the Israeli Army. Um, but this is a war. Uh, 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 it is it is like the Hundred Years' War. Uh, I, I use that metaphor because I have when I'm in my spare time, one of the things I read is the history of the Hundred Years' War, uh, and I I suddenly realized the Hundred Years' War went on for much more than a hundred years. By the way, um, the, I, the, the war between the British and the French crowns, um, and I thought this is the proper frame in which to put this book in order to shake the reader up. Um, so that's why I used that. That's why I use that as the main title. Now, why I use the cover illustration, I guess people don't see the cover, cover illustration. It's a picture of my grandfather's house, or rather the ruins of my grandfather's house near Jaffa. Um, and I think that people don't understand, because they're not allowed to see, because of the kind of censorship that Rosie alluded to, they're not allowed to see the material impact of this Hundred Years' War. Well, one of the material impacts is that Three, three quarters of a million Palestinians lost their homes, which were destroyed. Um, and I describe in the book the reasons that my grandfather's house, or rather the ruins, sorry, the ruins of my grandfather's house happen to still be there. Um, most, pe most people's homes were destroyed, or others were taken over and, and occupied by other people, by immigrants, Jewish immigrants. Um, and so I wanted to have a visual illustration of one of the main themes of this book, which is at, to get to the subtitle, Settler Colonialism and Resistance. Um, and this is one of the impacts, this house is one of the impacts of, of uh, this Hundred Years' War. Also, I talk a lot about my own family and, and my grandfather and my uncles and aunts and cousins weave through the narrative. And this is where most of them were born, uh, this house. Um, okay, so I wanna stick to the framework a little bit more because I, incidentally just taught Matthew Hughes's Britain specification of Palestine, uh, the British army, the colonial state and um, the Arab revolt, 36, 39. And so the 36, 39 revolt is very much on my mind and specifically the extent uh, to which the British went to crush right. the revolt, but also the revolt's legacy, which you talk about. You write uh, that the British forced or the British murdered 10% of the male Palestinian population. Actually, actually Hughes gives, gives better figures than the ones that I use in the book. And I'm going to correct. But he gives different, yeah. He gives They're different better. figures. His numbers are better and much higher. His numbers are worse, yes. Um, I, 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 more accurate and infinitely yeah. more painful. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you're right. Um, but you both agree that the British basically either murdered or exiled the majority of the Palestinian leadership which is one of several factors that ultimately facilitated the emergence of Israel in 48. Um, so this was a pivotal moment in Palestinian history. And yet it doesn't have its own chapter. You fold it into the 1917 chapter, which is chapter one, um, despite its centrality and legacy. And I noticed in talking about uprisings, right, and revolts, uh, the first intifada, I think um, you, you start off chapter, I wanna say chapter five, with the Palestinian Intifada in 87, and you frame it as a paradoxical result of Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Can you explain this choice and talk a bit more about these revolts? Yeah. Um, in fact, the, the, the war that is the subject of that chapter that starts with Balfour is the, the war by the British military to crush the Palestinians in 1936-39. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the pivotal event before 1948. In fact, it's more important in terms of what happens in Palestine than the actual events of the 1948 war. They're all prefigured and in a sense preordained by what happens during the Palestinian revolt. Uh, I give numbers uh, in the book drawn from the research of Walid Khaldi, a cousin of mine who produced an enormously influential volume uh, called Haven to Conquest in which he, he determined that as much as 10% of the adult male population of Palestine were killed, wounded, imprisoned, or exiled by the British, which is a huge proportion of the, of the young men and older men of Palestine uh, in 1936-39. Um, 
uh, here's his book, which, which uh, uh, Professor Bashir referred to, the, the, which is entitled Britain's Pacification of Palestine, uh, goes much deeper because the British archives were open to him in a way that when Walid Khadi wrote his book, they were not open to him. Uh, and he just determines that something between 14 and 17 percent of the adult male population of Palestine were killed, wounded, imprisoned, or exiled. So the breaking of the back of Palestinian resistance by 100,000 soldiers, about one soldier to every adult male Palestinian Arab. I mean, when you think of the numbers of soldiers and policemen and the armored vehicles and the naval, uh, naval vessels and the Air Force uh, as well, the Royal Air Force, you realize that a huge machine of repression was unleashed on the Palestinians and it really broke the back of their resistance. So I, I think that revolt is, is, in my view, central to my understanding of what happens up to 1948. Uh, I think the, sec the first and the second intifadas are important as well. The first, I think, more important than the second. Uh, the first intifada is one of the few instances, I argue, when the Palestinians actually uh, have a major achievement. They succeed uh, in a variety of ways in having a powerful impact uh, via a grassroots, bottom-up, a, a, a movement, largely nonviolent, not entirely nonviolent, certainly not involving weapons and explosives by, in, for, the, for, the, for the most part, mainly involving civil disobedience, uh, demonstrations, uh, and, and uh, some very ingenious uh, means of self-reliance to separate uh, Palestinian society from the occupying Israeli economy and society and military. Um, so I, as, as, in my view, uh, these two instances, as well as other instances of resistance, are really important in understanding that this is not a this is not a story of conquest and 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 defeat and conquest and defeat. Uh, there are phases of of really quite striking resistance, um, and in some cases these are successful. I would argue that whatever was achieved in 36 39 may have been thrown away at the negotiating table by the Palestinian leadership of the time, and I argue very forcefully in the book that what was achieved in the first intifada was thrown away in Oslo uh, by the PLO leadership. Um, those achievements were, 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 could and, and might have, have, have produced a better political outcome. So we'll get to that. I mean, I would like to talk about 82 and Oslo, but first I wanna, uh, let's explain the subtitle of, of the book, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917-2017, mm -hmm. because on page nine, you say that the modern history of Palestine can be best understood as a colonial war waged against the indigenous population. And you, lose, you use the language of indigeneity by mm -hmm. a variety of parties to force them to relinquish their homeland to another people against their will. You, you mentioned it briefly in your opening remarks, but why is it so important for you to frame the work through the lens of settler colonialism? Well, for several reasons. Um, First of all, because it's historically accurate. The Zionist movement saw itself as a settler colonial movement. Um, and I quote at length uh, the, the founders and framers of the whole Zionist project. Uh, I quote Herzl, I quote uh, Ben Gurion, I quote, uh, most importantly, Zeb Jabotinsky, who was by far the most honest of them all. Uh, when Ben Gurion and when Herzl uh, confided, uh, uh, they did so privately. Uh, when they when they talked about the settler colonial nature of what they were doing, even as they claimed rights in Palestine, they said we're we have a right to this country. We're going to recreate our people here. But what we were doing is doing what we are doing uh, is entirely identical to what European colonial powers do. They were talking privately to one another. Uh, Jabotinsky was much much more honest and much more forthright. And in that's why you call speech him after sighted. speech. Pardon me. That's why you call him clear sighted, I suppose. Uh, he's not only clear sighted; he's honest. He's forthright. He said, this is a colonial war. Every people that is, that, is, that is faced with what the Palestinians are faced resists the way the Palestinians are resisting. It's natural, it's normal, and we have to defeat them by force. Uh, the idea that this could be done as Herzl uh, in his response to a letter that one of my ancestors wrote to him said, oh no, we're going to make your lives better. We don't intend to do any harm to you. Jabotinsky throws right out the window. Uh, he makes it very clear. It will be an iron wall of a force that the Palestinians cannot overcome that will impose this settler colonial project on them. And I, I'm, I, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not making up the paradigm and I'm not adopting a Patrick Wolf or some you know, post-colonial, post-modern theorists ideas. 
I'm taking the words of the founders and framers of the Zionist project, which I think were clear sighted in private in the case of Ben Gurion and Herzl and in public in the case of Jabotinsky, uh, and I'm operationalizing them. I mean, we all understand the colonial nature of what goes on today in the West Bank. These are colonial settlements, these are colonies, these are clearly impositions on the landscape, the way that they're organized, the military nature. But in fact, that has been a consistent thread through uh, the, the way in which the Zionist project is operated as its leaders in, at the outset were, were perfectly willing to admit. So can you, I mean, I wanna talk more about the self description of Zionism, but can you tell us a bit more about the correspondence that you refer to yeah. between your great, great, great uh, uncle, uncle Yusuf Ria and yeah. uh, the founder of the Zionist movement, Theodor Herzl, and how Dia understood Zionism and its, its dangers. Right. Well, let me say who he was first. Uh, Yusuf Dia Pasha al Khaldi, who we call Yusuf Zia um, in the family, uh, was a unusual character. Uh, his father had a, a traditional religious education, uh, was the deputy judge and the chief secretary of the uh, Sharia court in Jerusalem. And that's a position that members of the family had held for many generations. He got a classical Islamic education, and then he decided he needed a different kind of education. So he went to a Protestant school in Malta, and then he went on to uh, study uh, in Istanbul uh, at what becomes later on uh, Boazirji University, Bosphorus University, which at the time was called Robert College. It was an American Protestant institution and at other secular schools. So he had a modern Western education. He later continued in uh, the, the Imperial Royal University in Vienna, uh, where he completed his education. He becomes an Ottoman official. He is eventually elected deputy of Jerusalem and serves at different times as mayor of Jerusalem. So this is somebody who has, and he's lived for uh, all, over, all over the Ottoman Empire and all over Europe. He lived in Russia as an Ottoman consul. He lived in Vienna, where he taught. And he knew a great deal about the persecution of Jews in Christian Europe. He knew a great deal in particular about the situation of Jews in Austria-Hungary, uh, where they were severely persecuted and where anti-Semitism was a feature of daily life, even in Vienna, where the mayor was a notorious anti-Semite. Uh, at times when he lived there. So he writes to Herzl in the year immediately after the first Zionist Congress, which took place in Basel in 1897. He writes to him in 1898. And he, he starts off by praising Herzl, whom he either knew or knew of. I think he probably knew of him. I'm not sure that he knew him. And he says, I understand where Zionism is coming from, because I understand what you are subjected to in Europe. Uh, we are cousins. He, 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 he repeats the, un the Islamic understanding of the relationship between Muslims and Jews as cousins, uh, descendants of Abraham. And he says, while I understand Zionism, you mustn't try to impose it in Palestine because that you have here a people who will not agree to be supplanted. And he ends by saying, you know, for the sake of God, leave Palestine in peace. I'm paraphrasing. Um, the interesting thing is not that Yusuf Dia understood Zionism and appreciated it, or that he felt that it would be a catastrophe for the Palestinians. The interesting thing is Herzl's response, hmm. because the disingenuous, supercilious, I would argue arrogant nature of Herzl's response has been replicated in every Israeli response, every Zionist and later on after the establishment of Israel, of every Israeli response to the Palestinians. Um, the argument that this was not, that this would not do harm to the Palestinians is something that, again, you go to Jabotinsky and you see that the clear-sighted leaders of this movement understood it could only be done by the destruction of Palestinian society and the erection of a Jewish society in its place. Um, Herzl denies this in his letter. And so I, I quote the letter, I quote both letters. I, I give the, the, the use of the letter in, in, in greater length, but I quote both letters because I think that that, that shows us something about the discourse down to this day. So then how, how do you think Herzl saw the Palestinians versus what the Palestinians actually were? First of all, Herzl knew nothing about Palestine. Uh, he paid one visit to the country, essentially to meet Kaiser Wilhelm during his visit in 1898. Um, he had been several times to Istanbul to try and persuade uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid to go along with the Zionist project. Um, as far as he was concerned, this was an empty country whose population, in his words, could be spirited across the frontiers, i.e. gotten rid of, uh, and replaced with a majority Jewish population. And the ones who stayed could stay. Um, but most of them could, in the words of 
in, in, in an entry in his diary, be spirited across the frontiers. We get we would get rid of them. Um, and so he saw this as a country which spoke to a need of European Jewry, uh, which at that point was in the midst of enormous persecution, the Kishniev pogroms, uh, the, 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 the deeply ingrained anti-Semitism uh, of uh, Austria-Hungary, uh, the Dreyfus trial, which uh, uh, Herzl as a journalist had covered. Uh, all of these things uh, convinced Herzl that uh, there was no place for the Jews in Christian Europe. And so for him, Palestine or some other place was an absolutely necessary uh, 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 alternative. Um, and the Zionist movement looked at various others. It looked at Argentina, it looked at Uganda, it looked at Sinai as possible alternatives to establish this Jewish state. Uh, but for many reasons, uh, Palestine was ultimately chosen. So if the founding fathers of Zionism described their movement in colonial terms, uh, and you mentioned Herzl, Japatinsky, Ben-Gurion, um, you talk about the Jewish Colonization Association. And so despite all the ink that's been spilled on this topic, it's still controversial to say that it's a settler colonial state. So why is it still controversial if the movement itself called itself that? And what are the political implications of calling it settler colonial? Well, I mean, it's controversial because that past has been whitewashed. Um, uh, at the very end of, of the 1930s, the British changed policy, having supported Zionism to the hilt, having crushed the Palestinians, having killed, wounded, exiled or imprisoned 15 to 17% of Palestinian adult males, the British turned around for reasons that had entirely to do with their strategic interests in World War II, and they limited their commitments to Zionism. This caused a clash between the British and the Zionist movement, which continues right up until 1947, when the British finally give up and hand the Palestine question over to the United Nations. Israel then refashions itself, or Israel then fashions, the Zionist movement in Israel then refashion themselves as anti-colonialism. So the spoiled stepchild of British imperialism, which could not have been established in Palestine without 100,000 British troops in the RAF, is suddenly anti-colonial. Um, the same militias that under Ord Wingate are trained to murder Palestinians in the night, blow up homes over their head as auxiliaries to the British. The British carried out one of the first and most effective counterinsurgency campaigns in modern history in Palestine. They learned from their Indian experience. They learned especially from their Irish experience and the links between British settler colonialism in Ireland and British se and the, the settler colonialism that the British fostered in Palestine are many and deep. And the, the people who were soldiers in, an, in a colonial campaign then come to depict themselves as anti-colonial. So in the wake of World War II, where suddenly colonialism is in bad odor, and nobody wants to be described as a colonialist. Uh, Israel describes itself as an as a, as an anti-colonial power. We fought the British, which for a very brief period actually was true. What's the impact of this? You, the second part of your question. Uh, I think it puts Israel in proper perspective, as a stepchild of British colonialism, as a, a project that could not have been established in Palestine in the 20s and 30s without the British. And as a, a, an entity which has developed on its own, which has developed into a national movement, a nation state, a people, but has only been able to do that with the kind of massive external support, which is characteristic of a colonial project and without which a colonial project cannot survive. Without the United States, Israel is not where it is today. The Security Council would have voted dozens of times uh, without the military aid, without the other forms of, of support from the United States which are in many ways even more important than what Britain was able to provide in the 20s and the 30s, Israel would not be in the position it is today. So I think the colonial, the colonial settler frame works brilliantly for the 20s and the 30s, but it is also applicable to the later periods. Right, and even, you know, Israeli historians themselves talk about, you know, the, the new now Israeli historian. Yes. Not, well, they, they started in the 80s and 90s right. with the revisionist moment. Um, and they, they sort of recognize the settler colonial nature of the state and what it took to build that state on Palestinian land. Right. But still, what I want to harp on a bit is the ability for some of these historians to still use this language until this day. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Israeli historians like Benny Morris, who as late as 20, uh, 2004 was able to say things in public to Haaretz uh, in an interview uh, that there are circumstances in history that justify ethnic cleansing. He then goes on to explain that cleanse uh, 
was commonly used at the time and appeared in all the archival records that he was using, uh, after which he proceeds to say that the failure of Ben-Gurion, who was engaged at the expulsion of Palestinians in 48, was that he did not complete the job. So right. Zionists could make such proclamations at the same time as they deny the, the settler colonial nature of Zion's project. Um, so it strikes me as though one can still make these remarks about Palestinians. It's not simply a thing of the past. It's an ongoing thing. How should we make sense of this? Well, I mean, it has to do with something that Edward Said said, which is that, you know, in addition to victories on the battlefield and the remarkable success of the Zionist project in building up a separate economy and building up a straight structure, even before the state of Israel was established, uh, Israel won in the discursive battle long before it was established, or I should put differently, the Zionist project uh, engaged in and won a discursive battle over, over establishing the terms of reference under which everything was discussed. And I think we're still struggling against that. Uh, ideas and concepts which are almost impossible to eradicate from the minds, especially of older people, are established in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, making the desert bloom, a land without a people for a people without a land. I mean, the, the myths, uh, Israel was on the brink of annihilation in 1967, and so on and so forth. And so tiny little Israel, David against Goliath. Uh, you know, the, the, the tropes are innumerable and they're ineradicable from the minds of most older people because uh, the success of this discursive pounding of, of theme after theme in uh, picture books, beautiful, glossy photographic books, in novels, Leon Uris, movies, Exodus, uh, on television, uh, uh, has, has established, certainly for an older generation, a set of ideas that are very, very hard to shake. Now, that's much less true of people of younger generations. Uh, they did not experience the Holocaust they were not traumatized by it in the same way as an older generation was. They didn't experience the 67 war when many people believed that Israel was on the brink of extinction. It wasn't. One of the things I show in the book is that everybody in Washington knew Israel would defeat the Arabs no matter what happened. They would crush them. If the Arabs attacked first, they would beat them. If, the, if Israel launched a preemptive war, they would annihilate them. Israel was never in danger of even losing the war, let alone being annihilated. But I, I describe in the book my own experiences in June 1967 when there were people frantically throwing money into bedsheets to save Israel from annihilation uh, right outside Grand Central Station here in New York City. Um, so I, I think that the power of that discursive victory over generations um, is something that we still are contending with. And that's why I think the book is actually powerful and so successful at a sort of attempt at decolonizing knowledge, uh, if, if we call it that. Um, you also write about the tension between Zionism uh, as a settler colonial movement and uh, uh, the nationalist nature of Zionism. It's, right. it's a tension. Can you talk a bit more about that? Um, did these two mark the Zionist movement from the very beginning? Uh, was it always, was the Zionist movement always a nationalist movement? When does it begin? Yeah. How do you, yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it's best understood in terms of comparative settler colonialism. Yeah. In other words, the only way you can understand how Zionism was and still is a settler colonial movement, and at the same time it becomes a national movement, is to look at other successful success, uh, sorry, other successful settler colonial experiments. We live in one. We are a nation state in the United States. We live in a country which was conquered from its native indigenous population by a white settler population, which has established a modern national entity, the United States of America. Canadians live in another one. Australians live in a third. New Zealanders live in a fourth. Israel is a fifth. Um, the difference is here, the, the, the indigenous populations were reduced to such an extent that one barely sees them unless one looks very carefully. That's also true of native nations in Canada, Canada Aboriginal populations and Maoris in, in, in Australia and New Zealand. In Palestine, the Zionist project was successful up to a point, but it did not completely destroy the indigenous population to the extent to which it was destroyed, whether by disease or by design in these other four uh, settler colonial uh, uh, projects, all of which created modern nation states. I mean, nobody says that there's not an American nation state or an American nationality. There is an Israeli nation state. Israeli Jewish nation state, from which Arabs who may be citizens of the state of Israel are actually excluded. 
real nationality in Israel is the nationality of the Jewish people. The others are citizens with much diminished rights, i.e. Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. And I think that that, that, that makes it a different kind of settler colonial uh, project than the ones here, which are assimilationist. I mean, you can read Patrick Wolf, who talks about some of this stuff in his last book. Um, but I think that I think that that's really, really important to understand. You can be, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can be a settler colonial movement that creates a nation state and, and creates a nation. So before I, uh, we open it up to the q and I, I, I do want to ask you one more question because we haven't really talked about the regional forces, the Arab dictatorships, um, and I want to hear you talking about 82 and about Oslo because these are quite poignant moments in your book. Right. Um, and when you talk about, when you write about Beirut, there's a sort of sadness. And when you talk about Oslo, there is a deep anger. Right. So can you talk about these two moments before we- Let me talk up? about them in a, a personal rather than analytical terms, uh, because I think the analysis, you'd have to read the book to follow it. Um, as far as the, the war in Beirut, the, the Israeli invasion of Beirut and the siege of Beirut are concerned and the subsequent massacres, uh, my family and I were living in Beirut at the time. And so I describe it from my perspective, the perspective of my wife, Muna, uh, to the extent to which I was able to interview them, my daughters who were little girls at the time and had told me what they remember. Um, and through the eyes of other participants or people who experienced uh, this, this, this war. Uh, and a couple of things are important about what happens in 1982. And these are things that we witnessed. Firstly, um, Israel is able to do this only because the United States gives a green light and supports it to the hilt. And I don't just say this because I think it hap I happen to think it's true or because it's ideologically convenient for my, me to say so. We now have American and Israeli documents that show the level of American collaboration, American. It, 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 this was an American-Israeli war. It wasn't just an Israeli war. The massacres were not just Israeli massacres or massacres by Lebanese whom Israel supported from a distance. Uh, the, the depopulation of the Palestinian camps was the intention, or one of the intentions of the invasion. It's discussed month after month after month between Israeli military and intelligence leaders, personnel, and the leaders of the Lebanese forces. And the Americans are complicit, as I argue in the book. So I, I talk about this, I, I suppose you're right, with a bit of sadness because we witnessed all of this. I mean, we witnessed the map. We were not in Sabra and Chetina, thank heavens, or we might not have survived. We were, we were safe somewhere else. Um, but we experienced it in Beirut at the time. And we experienced the war, the siege, the departure of the PLO. And then the regime that the United States and Israel established in Lebanon as one of the Israeli war aims that the United States approved uh, in May of 1982 when Secretary Haig met with uh, 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 Ariel Sharon, who was then Minister of Defense, and they agreed. You would expel the Syrians, you would defeat the Lebanese national movement, you would expel the PLO, and you would establish a puppet government in Beirut, which is what Israel tried to do. Um, so that's the 82 war. Uh, Oslo, you're, you're right, I think, also about the anger, because I was involved as a uh, uh, advisor to the Palestinian delegation that went to the Madrid peace conference and then to the 10 subsequent rounds of uh, Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. And the delegates and advisors like myself tried to craft an accord with the Israelis that would ultimately lead to self-determination and statehood. And we realized that there was an iron ceiling beyond which we could not go. And which in the book I explain in terms that I did not have at the time uh, 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 of American, prior American Israeli understandings, that, that this thing could only go so far, that it essentially would never go beyond what Begin it, Camp David in 1978 turned autonomy, i.e. Israel would continue to control all of the occupied territories, but there would be a Palestinian autonomy for the people, not the land. Israel would control everything and Israel would have control of the land. And those were red lines beyond which we discovered in Washington, the Israeli delegation was not prepared to go, whether it was sent by Prime Minister Shamir or whether it was sent by Prime Minister Abe. Uh, later on, the PLO leadership decided to accept those limits at Oslo in an agreement that was negotiated elsewhere uh, without our knowledge uh, in Washington. Um, and so, I mean, I'm angry because uh, uh, any fool could see what we saw in Washington, that this was not 
could not possibly have led to statehood and sovereignty for the Palestinians. It could not possibly have led to an end of settlement and colonization. It could not possibly have led to an end of occupation because those were red lines beyond which Israel and its American supporters were not willing to go. And those are red lines that unfortunately the PLO leadership accepted at Oslo. So maybe we can talk about this more in the Q&A. Um, maybe you can address some of the regional forces. Uh, ah, yes, uh, I didn't get uh, to that. Yeah, yeah. So Hillary. Yes, and Hillary. first I want to thank both of you. Um, that was a fantastic discussion overview. Also, for those of you who haven't read the book, I hope this also whets your appetite to actually go on and get the book because it is, it is fantastic. Um, one thing that I do want to uh, uh, raise and ask you, Rashid, if you could talk a little bit about this because it is mentioned in the book and also because we are a program that's based at the Divinity School, is the sort of the biblical coat that Zionism uh, wears. And it's not sort of the first colonial movement that, or settler colonial movement that uses biblical texts. Right. Um, you talk about how it's, it complicates things, but also the, the, the external support that it, it, it generates and how in this time and age, this is also a very important issue to um, be aware of and to talk about. Um, right. If you could just comment on that briefly. I, I think if, if one looks at the early history of the Zionist movement, it's clear that this, is, this sees itself as a modern secular national movement, uh, which it essentially was. And the fact that they were so flexible as to consider Argentina or Sinai or, mm. or uh, Kenya, uh, rather Uganda, as potential sites for the establishment of this national home indicates the fact that while the, the, biblical, the biblical link is important for Jews and for the Zionist movement, and ultimately became increasingly important, um, they saw this as a project to establish a Jewish state. And where they established it was secondary to the fact that this was necessary given the persecutions to which Jews were subject and Christians. Um, and I, the, the, the religious aspect has grown in importance in Israeli politics, in terms of, of, of the self-understanding of Israelis and of, of supporters of Israel. But I think if you go back to the roots, you will see that uh, this is essentially sees itself as a modern Western secular national movement, mm. uh, which it was. These were mainly assimilated Jews. These are mainly people who are not very religious. And that is true of, of most Israeli leaderships, of the leaders of the Zionist movement and most Israeli leaderships right up to the 1970s. Mm. Uh, and it's still true of many, many, many Israelis. Uh, nevertheless, the biblical connection is important. It's important because there is a connection between Jews and the Jewish people and, and the, what they call the land of Israel. There is a connection in their minds and in reality. Um, it's not an ethnic connection. The people who today call themselves Jews may or may not have actual genetic connections to whoever lived in, in, in Judah or in Israel uh, in the time uh, in, in, in 2,000 years ago. Uh, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is that there is a sense of continuity and connection, which is very important. Now, as I suggest, Zionism takes that, that religious coat and puts it on. And religion has become more important, not just in terms of Zionism in Israel. It's become more important for Palestinians too. It's become more important throughout the Muslim world. It's become more important through the Arab, throughout the Arab world. And so a religious dimension is added to what was seen by most people in the 20s and the 30s as a secular struggle between two groups of people who are trying to establish sovereignty in the country on the basis of claims which, yes, had to do with something, had something to do with religion, uh, but were essentially ethnic and national claims. Great. So we have um, lots of questions here. Um, let me start with um, one of the questions. You spoke about the durability of the mythology of Israel among older generations in the United States. To what mm -hmm. extent do you see a shift in American attitudes toward Israel and Palestine today, particularly among younger generations? Well, there's clearly a shift. I mean, uh, when I was an undergraduate very long ago, um, the word Palestine was taboo. It was considered an insulting and, and, and a dangerous thing to say, I am a Palestinian or there's a place called Palestine. Um, to this day, in some circles, the very mention of Palestine is considered anti-Semitic. Um, but things have really changed. I mean, if you look at the scholarship that is available today compared to the books that I could have used as an undergraduate, there's a world of difference. Uh, you have a range of specialists in literally every field, from literature to political science history, uh, 
<clears throat> sorry, sociology, anthropology, who have written about Palestine, Palestinians, and the history and the, and the, and the society and the economy of this place in ways that are completely different than anything that was available 50 or 40 years ago. So there's been a huge change on that front. There's also a, a change among younger people. Younger people are, subject, are not subject to quite the same level of brainwashing. Some of them are, but by and large, they have a much wider, broader source of, of information. And they have come to completely different conclusions. We see this on college campuses. Uh, Columbia undergraduates at Columbia College just passed a resolution supporting Columbia University's divestment from companies that support the occupation by a vote of almost 1,100 to less than 500. 40-something uh, percent of the student body participated. So very large level, high level of participation in a pandemic. Uh, this is Columbia University, similar resolution passed uh, at, at Barnard College, another undergraduate college at Columbia. Similar resolution passed the same week at University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. A similar resolution passed last year at Brown University. So clearly, as far as young people are concerned, there is uh, they're taking a different view. They're willing to be more open-minded, more critical. It doesn't mean they're necessarily hostile to Israel or, or anti-Zionist or anti-Israeli even. In fact, I would argue many of the people who voted in favor of divestment are, 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 are Jewish undergraduates who were probably have a connect, feel a connection to Israel and are in some ways sympathetic to it. They are opposed to Israeli policies and they can see both sides of the issue in a way that simply wasn't the case for anybody in the United States, I would argue, in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. Um, the other thing to, to, to see is the degree to which, at least among major populations of the United States, major parts of the American population, as represented in the majority party, the Democratic Party, which got 10 million more votes than the Republicans in the midterm elections of 2018, which I think shows who is the real majority. Among most sectors of that Democratic Party majority, there's an open-mindedness with regard to Palestine. Uh, and you see that in primary elections that are taking place all over the country for, for House seats. There are two of them here in New, York, in New York State. There was one in Illinois, there was one in Georgia where people were opposed by AIPAC in the Democratic primaries and won. People who said, we support the idea that the Palestinians have rights and that maybe there should be limits on support for Israel. But you couldn't say those things in American politics 10 or 15 years ago. I'm not saying that they're the majority any, at, at this stage, though there are polls being done that show that majorities of Democrats, at least, it's not true of Republicans, but majorities of Democrats, majorities of the majority party are sympathetic to the Palestinians in ways that was never the case before. Yeah, great, thank you. I, I have a, another question here from Maddie Milstein. Um, and basically he's, how come, his question is about process. How comfortable or uncomfortable did you feel when taking the unprecedented step as a historian and injecting yourself for the first time into this book? And why did you decide to do this? Um, do you think that this played a role in making the book as Professor Bashir just described it, your most powerful work? I mean, I did it because my son, who's a playwright and who is a very persuasive young man, um, and my cousin, Noef, who was, was a diplomat, is now a judge, and both of whom are persuasive characters, <laughs> said to me, you really have to write a book that people can relate to. And you and my son in particular, I mean, who's written plays where he, he tries to, you know, where, where, where you do have the first person operating, said, you have to put yourself into this book. I mean, I, we would tell the, the kids stories about things that had happened to us. Muna and I would tell them stories about things that happened to us, for example, in Beirut or whatever. And they say, you've got to put that in the book. I said, well, I can't put that in the book without putting myself in the book. And he says, what's wrong with that? And so basically I was persuaded to do this, um, uh, essentially by, by Ismail and Nawaf and a few others also pushed me. Uh, whether it's more, the, more accessible or not, I, I hope it is. Um, you know, I, I, I've written what I can write uh, for other academics. Uh, you know, Palestinian identity puts out as clearly as I can uh, uh, certain kinds of arguments that I think only an academic and only a specialist or historian could love. Uh, in this book, I'm really trying to speak to a, an audience that is not expert. There are 45 pages of footnotes. So if you want substantiation for what I say, it's there. Uh, but you don't have to read them. You can just read the narrative. Right. I think oh. if, I may jump, if I may just piggyback on this, you know, I've known you for two decades, Rashid, almost. Um, and it strikes me as though the book has impact you, impacted you deeply, both personally and professionally. Mm. It, so I wonder if, if, if you feel like the book has actually 
changed you in some ways, having written this kind of narrative? I, you say I, I somewhere would, that it's cathartic, so I'm just yeah, curious to hear. I, 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 I'm not sure that it has changed me, but I think I have changed, and that made me able to write the book. Um, I began to read the work of older historians who, who, who start finally to say, I'm going to inject myself into the narrative. Uh, uh, Mark Bloch, before he wasn't very old when he was murdered by the Nazis, but he wrote, he wrote a book about the defeat of France in 1940 where he talks about his own personal experiences. And I said to myself, if Mark Bloch can do it, one of the greatest historians you know, of the modern era, uh, why can't I do it? I mean, I've written the books I need to write. Um, uh, it's about time to, to do that. And so I, I, have, I agree with you, I have changed. And whether the book changed me or not, I don't know. Thank you, Rashid. Um, we, are, we have very little time left and so many good questions. I'm going to squeeze in one, one uh, quick question here, realizing we only have about three minutes left. So I ask for you to be brief. For those of us who work in building understanding and dialogue between Jews and Palestinians in the respective diasporas, how do we hold that Israel was and is a settler colonial project and simultaneously remain committed to building understanding and empathetic listening between the two peoples? Because I think that understanding and empathetic listening has to be based on justice and equality. You're not going to have understanding and empathetic li listening between white Americans and black Americans unless the heritage of Jim Crow, segregation, the destruction of reconstruction and slavery is right in front of us. If that's not right in front of us, and we don't, and we lie about that, and we mask that, you don't have empathy. You have a reproduction of the existing unequal understanding. And I would argue that's true about America and its native population. You cannot have an understanding of America except as a settler colonial society. That doesn't mean we have to get to sackcloth and ashes and flagellate ourselves. It means we have to recognize the truth of the history. And I, I don't think you can have understanding and reconciliation on a basis of lies and deceit and hiding basic realities. You have to admit those realities to get to real understanding and real reconciliation. And that has to be based on justice and equality. What Israelis claim for themselves, security, Palestinians have to have. What Israelis claim for themselves as the right to go to Israel, any, Jew, any person who's Jewish can go to Israel, has to be acceptable for everybody, for Palestinians, and so on and so forth. If you don't base these things on justice and equality, you're reproducing unequal, unjust relationships, which prevent peace and equality, peace, justice, and, 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 and resolution uh, of these conflicts. So I, I think without facing the history, you can't get to where people who want to have that kind of understanding want to get to. Thank you. That's a pers perfect ending. And actually, for those of you who have not read the book, again, please get the book because Professor Rashid Khalidi also has recommendations for how we can reach that reconciliation and what we need to do. Um, I uh, have deep appreciation and thanks for both Professor Khalidi, Professor Bashir for joining us for the, the, the in-depth conversation we had. I know our time is limited, but I uh, really appreciated everything you shared. I um, thank you all of those who have joined us in the webinar and thank you all those who asked questions and I'm very sorry we could not get to all of them. But I do hope that you will get the book and hopefully some of your questions will be answered. But um, thank you all and we hope you will join us in future webinars, but also attend the Professor Bashir's book launch next week on the 20th. That, um, thank you, Hillary. Thank you all, and have a good week. Thanks, Bye -bye. Rosie. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.